I'm Kaya. I'm Jorge. I'm Anna. I'm Sheer. I'm Caroline. I'm Connor. I'm Maddie. I'm Kelsey. <laughs> I'm Xander. I'm Mikey. I'm Ray. I'm Mrs. Dyke. And I'm Miss Smith. We're Trout Transit! Here, you will get a detailed look behind everything we've done, from how we've formed, to all of our experience, to what our solution consists of. Let's begin with our background. As we were thinking of a project to work on Expo for, an elementary school teacher from our school district addressed us with an issue she had seemed to notice. With her being a trout expert, it had been brought to her attention by the town of this bridge. After hearing about the issue from our science teacher, Ms. Smith, we quickly realized that this was to be our long-term project. And off we went, began our research. First, we started with online sources. We found out more on the history of the bridge, including the date it was built and the structural deficiency of it. Another group of us decided to do research on the brown trout species. We found out the time in which it mates, the usual environment, and a bit more. We also did research on the river below, finding out it's stocked with 400 trout annually. But we needed more information from experts, thus we got in touch with some local experts via email. The first person to respond was Mr. Jeff Yates, Director of Volunteer Operations for Trout Unlimited. Trout Unlimited devotes their time to conserve, protect, and restore North America's cold water fisheries and their watersheds. Jeff was it's the perfect person to interview in order to receive information about brown trout. And when the water gets constricted into that narrow gap, it increases the velocity, uh, the speed of that water, so that what's happening downstream is it's coming out of that bridge at a faster velocity than it normally would. It's coming in a, from a straight channel that's been built by people so that it's, it's, it's speeding up and it's causing damage to the habitat downstream. I could go even further because, um, as you know from erosion, what happens when, when, when a stream bank erodes? It takes soil from the stream bank and it moves it into the river. So now you have issues where another thing the trout need is clean, healthy gravel. Um, in order to, if they were gonna rebuild the bridge, one of the things they would want to make sure they do is not uh, create any barriers, any kind of dam or culvert that prevents the fish from getting upstream. Generally speaking for, for, for trout and for almost all living things is to try to have a pH right around 7, right? In terms of temperature, uh, trout, anything over 70 degrees Fahrenheit, exposure is that long, trout become very stressed and, and it can cause fish kills. The warmer the water is, the less dissolved oxygen it, it maintains in the, in the system. And so if there's not enough dissolved oxygen, there's, there's not enough you know, oxygen in the water for the trout to breathe. As you can see, Jeff had a lot to contribute to our understanding of trout. We then got in touch with a civil engineer by the name of Mr. Brandon Brazil, who explained to us some of his experiences with environmental obstacles. As we continued to look for more experts to reach out to, a response email from Mr. Matthew Knickerbocker entered our email. Mr. Knickerbocker is the first selectman of Bethel, so we were ecstatic to know that we would get some behind-the-scenes information on the bridge. The information he's given us has completely boosted our research by far. Uh, so we're talking about the Plum Trees Bridge that's going to go under construction actually within the next month. We're going to break ground on that. And personally, I'm really excited about that because th this was actually designed almost 18 years ago, and it's taken that long to get it to this point. And, what, and the question you ask about what kind of modifications had to be made is really why it took so long. Do you believe it's important to improve the habit of the trout while we work on the bridge? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. I, I'm a big believer in environmental protection and uh, disrupting nature as little as possible when these things are done. The, and it's, you know, it's something that wasn't, that wasn't a philosophy that was in place in government not too many decades ago, but the uh, state of Connecticut is very, very strict about these things. The town of Bethel was very strict. 
and these are enforced through our uh, town's, uh, um, it's called the Commission of Inland Wetlands. And they are very meticulous and they really require that environmental protection be the top priority in any kind of a, any kind of a project like this that's gonna cause some kind of disruption. Uh, disruption can't be completely avoided, but it, it can be minimized and everything can be put back so that you know, uh, nature continues the way it was intended. The access to this information became very useful to the rest of the project. In April, the construction did start, and we happened to be in the right place at the right time. The last person we came in contact with was an accident. As we were down by the bridge doing testing, we ran into the structural engineer of the construction site. He cleared up many inconsistencies that we previously thought. There's what the final intersection is going to look like. Wow, wow. That's so much with, better. That is a massive improvement. <laughs> this interview leads right into the experiments. The first one we tested was the traffic flow affecting pH and CO2 of the water. We had multiple days of trials in which increased our validity. We took our lab quest and vernier sensors down to the river and recorded all of our data. We came back to find some interesting results. Just as we thought, as more cars passed over the bridge per minute, the carbon dioxide in the air increased as well as the pH of the water. Since this was all recorded around roughly 11 o'clock, the traffic flow was not as high as rush hour, but the experiment still gives us a good sense of what the exhaust from the cars is doing to the water. The next experiment we decided to take was the traffic flow experiment. This experiment consisted of finding the amount of traffic that goes over the bridge and how that affects the stress level of the bridge. Using AP physics, we calculated the stress on the bridge was normal, but since the bridge is weak, it causes a danger to society. We also did what we call a stream beds experiment. This is where we take seven separate fish tanks and fill them with different types of bedding straight from the river. One was the control with no bedding and just tap water. Two had silt from the river and tap water. Two had rocks from the river with tap water and two had sand from the river and tap water. We took these tanks up to the classroom and did experiments on them sporadically. From here, we tested the pH, the temperature, and the amount of dissolved oxygen from each tank for the next two weeks. Our hypothesis that the silt would have the biggest negative impact on the water was supported. The temperature of the silt would be too high for the trout to live in, causing the species to be in danger. The amount of dissolved oxygen was way too low for the fish to live in, being three parts per million, where optimal would be around 10 ppm. Another experiment we derived information from was testing the stream flow. Here we measured the pressure both upstream and downstream near the bridge and got interesting results. As you can see, the downstream flow was relatively more forceful than upstream, which supported our hypothesis, which stated that the flow would be more forceful because of the narrower pathway. In total, we visited the bridge four times, once to take pictures, once with mystery aids, and twice for experiments. As we were going down for our second day of experimental findings, we came to see men chopping down the trees surrounding the bridge. This is where we found the structural engineer to interview, but we had to relocate in order not to endanger ourselves from the falling trees. Luckily, there was a part of the river that was not near construction, and there we had it. All of our research was collected and ready to log. Once gathering all of our data needed, we quickly realized that our mission was not to create a design of an efficient bridge and propose it to the town, since they had already clearly designed a bridge. Our main goal now is to periodically take data collections throughout the course of time it takes for this bridge to be complete. We will serve as the watchdogs in order to ensure the river conditions are safe for the trout to live. Who knows what more we may discover relating to this bridge. All we can say is that each individual has dedicated a major part of their lives in order to protect the species of brown trout under the bridge. We hope you enjoyed, and remember, don't fear trout, we'll help you out.